Hello, everybody. Um, welcome to the Ernst Cliff webinar on critical minerals in North American EV battery value chain. Thanks for joining us. I'm Bud Locklear, a principal in the Ottawa Office of Ernst Cliff Strategies and uh, your host for this webinar. And our theme is timely coming just days before the world's largest mining conference, the Annual Prospectors and Developers Association of Canada, or PDAC conference, that kicks off in Toronto on Monday, June 13th. We expect to see senior government delegations from around the world at PDAC to highlight policies and financial support for the mining, extraction, and processing of the strategic materials necessary for the electric vehicle transition. And we're going to see major companies representing mining, extraction, processing, battery assembly, all the way through to final EV assembly. And they'll be represented at PDAC too. So in the run-up to PDAC 2022, we're delighted to share this gathering of distinguished individuals to discuss the broad strategic context and the economic imperatives linking Canada's critical mineral endowment to the global EV battery chain. And also, we're going to speak to the importance of reshoring to North America the refining and processing of critical minerals essential to building a durable and resilient battery value chain. Our panelists are Susan Crystal, Consul General of the United States of America at the U.S. Consulate General in Toronto, Jeff Labonte, the Assistant Deputy Minister in the Lands and Minerals Sector of Natural Resources Canada, David Patterson, VP Corporate and Environmental Affairs for General Motors Canada, and Rahul Betty, a principal at Ernst Cliff Strategies in our Toronto office. I think it's going to be a great conversation, and I want viewers to know that you can be part of it too. You can pose your questions using the Zoom Q&A feature, and we'll try and select a few for our panel to answer. If you vous pouvez poser les questions en français, on va essayer de répondre en français aussi. Okay, um, to set the context of the conversation, I'm going to actually read an excerpt from a June 7th Bloomberg story with the title, How Battery Metals Squeeze Puts EV Future at Risk. Quote, the world's epic shift into electric vehicles needs to overcome a major obstacle. How to meet rocketing demand for batteries, the vital component, while cutting the cost to help the cars go mainstream. Factory lines churning out power packs to fuel a clean energy future are being built faster than strained supply chains can keep up. A global rush to lock in stocks of lithium, nickel, cobalt, and other key ingredients from a handful of nations has sent prices hurtling higher. There are major concerns over China's industry-wide dominance and moves in some other countries to restrict mineral exports in hopes of building their own manufacturing base. It's a scenario that risks slowing the pace of EV adoption, end quote. So with that precy in mind, I'd like to kick off the discussion by asking each panelist to say a few words from their individual perspective about their connection to this issue, their interest and or significance of critical minerals and the importance of reshoring the EV battery chain in North America. And I'd like to start off, Susan, with you. Thank you, Bud. Thanks for the kind introduction and thank you to Ernst Cliff for today's event. For us at the U.S. Mission to Canada, we are focused on promoting mutual prosperity through trade missions, cultural exchanges, and regular dialogues like these to strengthen the already formidable U.S.-Canada economic and commercial ties. I think we'll hear a little bit today about the roadmap for a renewed U.S.-Canada partnership that President Biden and Prime Minister Trudeau agreed to in February 2021. The roadmap creates a shared vision for sustainable and inclusive economic recovery that strengthens the middle class, creates more opportunities for hardworking people, and ensures that people have good jobs and careers on both sides of the border. And we certainly are committed to doing this in a way that addresses the disproportionate negative impacts on women, youth, underrepresented groups, and Indigenous peoples on both sides of the border. Within the roadmap, both countries agreed to strengthen the Canada-US Critical Minerals Action Plan to secure the critical minerals and metals needed to support a net zero industrial transformation, batteries for zero emission vehicles, and renewable energy storage. Critical minerals are vitally important to our transition to clean energy and our long-term energy and economic security. Economic security is national security, and for the United States, this is a whole of government priority. We are eager to engage and to deepen our cross-border ties in Ontario and with Canada in this crucial area. And to end, I would just, as, as probably the most lay person on our panel, shout out to my science teachers in high school that I actually paid attention to the periodic table, but I would say that I might not have paid as much attention because there's certainly a lot of the minerals that we're talking about that I didn't know much about. So this is a learning experience for me too. Back to you, bud, thank you. Thanks, Susan. Jeff. 
Well, uh, let me echo the uh, the thanks to you, Bud and Ernst Clift, and to the uh, panelists who are taking the time today to join. So David and Susan and Raul, uh, thanks for you as well. So I, I think I could repeat a fair bit of what Susan had to say, and maybe I'll draw out a number of important components. So I, I think we can start with critical minerals being a, a priority in both, both governments and a priority both from the economic perspective of ensuring our future prosperity, working in continuing to have strong cross-border relationships for our business community, trade, our cultural community, and, and all of the communities that sort of interact daily and in the thousands of interactions that, that are so important to both of our countries. But I think the context for critical minerals also um, underlines the importance of the relationship with the United States that's also extended into the security context and into our very common value framework for things like um, environment and protection of the environment, labor standards and strong labor standards, and you know, clear, clarity around the rules, rules of law and contract that happen in markets that happen around the world. And this is a particular place where Canada and the United States shine. Um, and work together and have those common frameworks. So this particular uh, construct around looking at uh, electric vehicle batteries and looking at critical minerals and their importance to it brings together, I think, the uh, some very important elements of our transition to a net zero future, um, that clean energy future that we all aspire to in both countries. And of course, the importance of that to our society and keeping it vibrant and prosperous and healthy from the perspective of communities where critical minerals are produced and mined and extracted to communities who rely on critical minerals in their everyday goods, whether they're, um, you know, the, the phones we hold in our hands, the medical devices that are used in doctor's offices and health hospitals around the country, to the electricity generation and the transmission of that, um, of that energy across the country. So these are vitally important uh, matters. They are matters that are both of, of, of significant attention and in, in the policy and the senior leadership of government working with industry and civil society and communities. Here in Canada as well, I want to underline the importance of Indigenous communities being an important part of the mining community already, but also extremely important as we think about critical minerals development and as we kind of move to that transition, um, having recognized the Indigenous population in Canada's proximity, but also the opportunity uh, to benefit and to contribute to um, that transition, but also to prosper from it as well. So I think those are really important. Susan really um, uh, nicely laid out the action plan, and I'm sure we'll get some more conversation on that action plan, which is something that uh, the government of Canada has, has stood behind and is extremely proud of the work that we've launched with the United States to continue in that fashion. So I look forward to the conversation today. Thank you, Bud. Thanks, Jeff. Raul. Well, and again, thank you, Bud, for bringing us together, and, and thank you all for joining us here today. I will say I'm not nearly as accomplished as my fellow panelists, uh, and I am very much looking forward to hearing their analysis and their views. Uh, what I do hope to bring to our conversation today is some insight around uh, the political context of these issues. Uh, I have been fortunate to have had a front row seat supporting uh, political decision makers within government around the development of approaches uh, to supporting critical mineral development across the entire value chain to end use, uh, including the recent and I think exciting revitalization of our automotive sector here in Ontario. And I really think there is a growing consensus that the transition, uh, particularly to battery electric, represents a great generational opportunity for Canada and Ontario. You know, as the second largest auto manufacturing jurisdiction in North America, you know, we've always had a, a proud legacy of final assembly in Ontario. Uh, but this transition uniquely positions us to now maximize greater potential across all parts of the production process, uh, from critical minerals, where we have ample lithium, nickel, and cobalt, for example, uh, to midstream processing, uh, battery manufacturing, and of course, final assembly. So from my perspective, it's heartening to see the private sector, governments at both the federal and provincial levels, and our key trading, par uh, trading partners all realize the potential and now be rowing in the same direction. Because uh, I think ultimately that's what it will take uh, for us to be successful. So very much looking forward to exploring that further today in our conversation. Great. Thanks, Rahul. David. Thanks, Bud. And I'll just build a little bit on what Rahul is saying. And um, uh, from the perspective of General Motors, um, 
you know, this is the biggest technological transformation in the auto sector since we left horses behind at the turn of the century. And so a hundred years forward, um, it's not going to be an easy transformation, but, you know, we're all in, in our company. And I think you'll find right across the industry that uh, those horses have all left the barn. We are, are all running towards full electrification. And so our plan is to have our entire fleet of vehicles, every light duty fleet uh, of vehicle that we've got from pickup trucks down to uh, to cars like the Chevrolet Bolt EV that we already have in the market being full battery electric, no hybrids, no plug-in hybrids. We're going all in owning our own battery technology, a company called Ultium, which we partner together with LG Chem. Uh, and we, we're going to do that by 2035, which aligns up with a lot of the targets in the roadmap and, and between the governments and our whole company um, and our facilities to be uh, carbon neutral by 2040. It's a huge challenge. And so I spend most of my time thinking about the barriers to that, trying to remove them. Um, General Motors, of course, is known to be founded in Detroit, um, but, uh, you know, we've been in Canada since uh, Colonel Sam McLaughlin moved from horses back in Oshawa uh, to, to build some of Canada's first uh, uh, vehicles um, back then. So for me, and coming from a mining family, all this kind of comes together in an incredible generational opportunity, as, as we often refer to it. You know, there's over 150 communities across Canada that depend on mining. Um, we have uh, incredible reserves, but one of the areas when we talk about critical minerals, um, we're going to need a lot of them, you know, hundreds of thousands of tons of them for our batteries um, going forward. If you, you think about it, you know, we produce 17 million vehicles in North America every year, sometimes stretching up um, higher than that. If all of those have full batteries, we're going to need a significant amount. And so to your quote, it's really about reshoring into North America. America. We have great sources of reserves in Indonesia and China and all around the world. And uh, some of those places are perhaps even a little ahead of us in terms of the EV future. But um, we also have great reserves in Canada. Sometimes in Canada, we have reserves that are uh, even stronger than in the United States. We build things together. The whole auto industry is here in Canada because of a North American approach, an integrated approach. So we got to solve these problems together. And uh, critical minerals is one. There's some others we may talk about as well. Thanks, David. In fact, that's a great segue into, I guess, the, the question about your company having made significant investments in, in, in Canada. Uh, wondering if you can tell us a little bit about that that vision for the EV battery value chain in North America, the integration on, in both countries, et cetera. Sure. Well, as I say, it, it's moving fast. We're, um, as I say, it, it uh, the focus in your engineering and your planning and your capital planning, we're, we're planning to spend $35 billion billion dollars on this shift over to electric vehicles it's a considerable bet and if uh, we get that wrong and our consumers don't buy these evs boy have we messed up so we've got to get this right and uh, we need to work with governments both in the united states and canada um, but we really want to make sure as we're building battery plants and uh, what we've done here in canada is noteworthy we're going to open Canada's first electric vehicle plant in Ingersoll later this year, uh, where we're going to build our bright drop cargo vans, which will be all electric, and, and that's exciting. Uh, we have announced with a partner, POSCO, that we're going to be processing uh, cathode active materials, which is about 40% of what goes into, into our batteries to supply our battery plants out of Quebec. Quebec has an incredible story in terms of uh, low GHG, reliable and affordable electricity and, and great infrastructure. So, man, it's really good to be back in Quebec, I'll tell you. Um, love working with, with that uh, part of, of the future. But as Raul says, Ontario and the rest of Canada have great resources as well. Um, but uh, um, so we're all in there. We're, we're making the transformation of our vehicles. Um, you'll see them in the showrooms progress and and uh, that will accelerate uh, but it's uh, the opportunity to no longer in Canada be drawers of water and hewers of wood um, it would be really good if we could um, not only have minerals here but to process them here as well and to, to have that added value in the jobs but uh, that will require a lot of focus at various levels of government um, to not only um, uh, 
build on the reserves that we have and bring them to light. But uh, to get the right processing facilities, we're starting that trend um, in Béconcourt, uh, Quebec. Um, but um, uh, to do it quickly enough, because um, we're, we will have this plant in Quebec up in two years. And so if we don't have sources and source agreements for nickel and cobalt and those kinds of things, guess where those minerals will continue to come from? And so, you know, we've got an opportunity, but the gate is not open for an indefinite period of time. We've got to move this thing along. And therein lies one of the sort of collective challenges that we have. Well, th that's uh, an excellent, I guess, entree to the question I'm going to pose to Susan, which is, you know, I, we kind of know the answer to this already, you know, are Canada, the United States competitors or, or collaborators in developing a North American battery EV chain? And I guess the key question is, well, how much are the two countries doing together? And, uh, you know, how much further can the two countries go? Thanks. Um, so it, uh, just a one comment to David's point. Uh, you know, you're absolutely right. We've got to get this right. But I'll tell you, as you talk to friends and family and colleagues, you know, people seem to be really, really interested in buying electrical vehicles. So if we can get them going, I think there's there's certainly right now there seems to be a great interest. And of course, this probably doesn't hurt that the gas prices are so high. But in any case, uh, the United mm -hmm. States uh, is definitely working with allies and partners throughout the Western Hemisphere to address the global supply chain disruptions and we share the goal of a decarbonized future. Given that the transportation sector is the United States' top greenhouse gas emission source, and I believe Canada's second biggest emission source, the shift to electric vehicles represents a significant transformation in the history of the, in the, history of the auto industry, as well as a key part of our energy and technology security. Large capacity batteries like those used in EVs and stationary energy storage, which facilitates accelerated deployment of technologies like solar and wind on our grid and in our homes are essential to meeting our climate goals. These two sectors, transportation and the power sector account for more than half of the United States carbon emissions. Our industries are well integrated between our two countries and we are both prioritizing investments in the electrification of the transport sector. We see such investment here in Canada and in the United States, but there will be a need for even more investment in all sectors that contribute to a low carbon future. On the collaboration side, our Secretary of Commerce, Raimundo, and Canada's Innovation Science and Economic Development Canada, Development Canada Minister, Champagne, outlined a plan, a work plan in November, 2021 to increase cross-border collaboration and advance post-COVID-19 economic recovery efforts. At that time, the two leaders agreed to reinforce existing cooperation under the US-Canada Critical Minerals Action Plan and to deepen in industry engagement to target a net zero industrial transformation, batteries for electric vehicles and renewable storage for energy. Securing the critical minerals necessary for the clean energy transition is crucial, of course, because Chinese companies control most of the current global supply. So whether we are collaborators or, or competitors, we are most def definitely collaborators. We're working together so that we both can be more competitive in this critical sector. Thank you, Susan. Um, you know, Jeff, uh, Susan talked a lot about that, that collaborative, the continental collaboration, but Canadian officials, you know, speak a lot about the endowment of critical minerals in this country. And I'm wondering how important is that for supplying the world's, the global market for, for critical minerals? Uh, is that part of Canada's objective as well? Well, thanks, Brad. And, and um, I think building on the conversation to, to start, I mean, our, 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 our view of critical minerals is that Canada has a, a blessing of, 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 of an endowment of many minerals. Um, we also have a fairly rich history in developing those minerals and doing them in the way that's the most environmentally uh, sustainable and, and a strong service and financial sector that kind of help make mining uh, an important sector of the economy here in Canada. So it would be only natural that we would partner with our closest ally to kind of continue and advance that together as a collaborative piece. But I think the world events around us um, beyond just the transition to EVs um, and other world events have kind of demonstrated that there is a, uh, a fair bit of volatility around the world with respect to commodities and energy and a number of inputs into supply chains, and that those vulnerabilities really reinforce, as COVID has, the need to kind of 
domestically think in a North American context, how we work together and how supply chains can be secured for both countries. And in industries like the auto industry that are so integrated, it's only natural that we would want to work together and be stronger together uh, at kind of reshoring and, and building that resiliency. So we do see, uh, as, as, as Susan mentioned, the United States says, we do see the same thing from a Canadian government perspective, working with like-minded partners around the world. So working with the EU who share, I think, like North America, some of the same values and importance of critical minerals, but also um, just to underline the point, um, how critical minerals are developed in many ways now and into the future are going to be just as important as the minerals themselves. Uh, you know, most corporate companies, and David can probably speak to this more thoroughly, but most uh, of the corporate and large companies working in the auto space and others, other areas demonstrate that they want to know that the minerals are produced properly, that the environment has been taken into account, that labor standards and governance and communities such as indigenous communities are part of that development and, and benefit from it. And those are important components that perhaps up till now, we haven't necessarily had our eye on but as we think about the world around us and the world into the future it is just fundamental that those things happen so thinking about what often is referred to as esg or environment uh, governance and social standards as part of the equation so canada really reinforcing that point and i think from a values point of view that's entirely consistent with the roadmap uh, that that the president biden and prime minister trudeau have signed and we're finding it entirely consistent with a number of our important allies in europe in Japan, for example, where we where we have very similar views and we have very similar interests. So that collaboration starts close to home uh, and then allows us to be stronger as we think about other partners that would be close with us around the world. Great, thank you. Ro, let's take it from the international and, and national level, bring it down to sort of the subnational pr provincial level. So Ontario's critical mineral strategy was, was released uh, earlier this year. How well did the provincial and federal critical mineral, mineral plans fit together? You know, I think the, the federal and provincial strategies complement each other quite well. Uh, as part of their strategy, both governments have produced a list of 30 or so minerals that they consider, quote, critical uh, for specific industrial, technological, or strategic applications. Uh, and there is significant overlap between what uh, both the federal and provincial governments have deemed critical. This is important uh, because, as we know, there actually is no a uh, universally accepted definition of what a critical mineral is. Uh, so, it, you know, it's very important that the federal and provincial governments have aligned on this or, and are singing from, this, from a similar song sheet as a starting point. Uh, um, both, both strategies, is, uh, as Jeff outlined, also share similar ambitions and pillars around economic development, sustainability, uh, and supply chain security. But of course, as they say, the proof is in the pudding. And, and I think the most important collaborations are where both governments have put both their political and financial capital into motion. Uh, and we've seen that in, in a number of instances over the past 18 months across some of these priority areas, uh, including joint investments in Cobalt, Ontario, uh, to spur the development of North America's first Cobalt refinery. Uh, and a, of course, the joint efforts to help attract nearly $14 billion in new auto sector investments, much of that in the next generation technologies including, as, as David mentioned, GM's exciting new bright drop product in Ingersoll, Ontario. Um, and so, you know, with the recent re-election of Premier Ford uh, in, in, uh, in the provincial election that just ended uh, and his government here in Ontario, I think it's overall a positive development that we'll, we'll, we'll see uh, you know, to build on this ongoing momentum. Thank you, Raul. Um, you know, stemming from, from what you just mentioned and, and Susan and, and, and Jeff, you talked about government investments and, and David, you talked about what's what's kind of needed to, to move us forward. And that pulls the question, I'll just kind of throw it out there and whoever wants to jump on it, please do. You know, what, kind, what scale of investment is actually needed? And what are the kind of government policies that, that are required to enable investment um, to, to happen? So um, love to hear a perspective if you're able to offer it, maybe David, and maybe I'll, I'll preface this by saying, you know, a few years ago, Mark Carney, then as the governor of the Bank of England, was talking about the need for something like $4 trillion a year 
uh, of investment from the private sector to move us towards a, a clean economy. That's you know across all sectors, four trillion a year in private investment year after year. Um, can you put that put put what investment is needed in, in North America into context? I, I don't have a total number. I mean, I threw out thirty-five billion as an indication that uh, to our shareholders, we've we've uh, signaled as the investment that we're making, and uh, you know, it it uh, you so you can multiply that by the number of car companies. You can uh, then think about what it's going to take for existing mining companies to expand their production. So you know, take nickel for example, which is probably the biggest, most important thing that Canada has to offer, uh, in my opinion. Um, you know, there is existing um, great reserves for mining for stainless steel, but uh, you know, the nickel sulfate market to supply cathode active materials that then go into batteries, that then go into cars, that's a whole new market. Uh, for that type of um, of product, and so you know there is the need to either expand um, current um, and existing reserves or to find new ones, and we have new ones. We even have some that are already approved and ready to go, um, but it still takes time, and uh, you know we need to uh, um, uh, do it in North America in a way that is sustainable and uh, and responsible, and we've made that commitment. Um, and we can do that also by working with groups like the Initiative for Responsible Mining or IRMA. Uh, the Mining Association of Canada has a really very good standard and, you know, right down to, you know, uh, uh, auditing the individual mines and, and making sure that uh, proper standards are followed, et cetera. And that can be a differentiator for us in North America. And I, you know, I think, I really think of North America as a, as a, uh, a power trading block in the world today. Um, it needs itself. It needs to work with itself. Um, you know, we produce uh, not only for the world's most valuable market, um, but, uh, you know, we can, um, we can supply it from here too. It would, uh, we don't want to have to rely on, on bringing minerals in from Australia and Latin America and, and all of that, if we can do it here and, and reap a green tech environmental benefit and do it properly and better than anywhere else in the world. Um, but, you know, like all of these things, boy, is it complicated. I mean, just just the little string of what I've just talked about for one input that goes into an electric battery, you multiply that by everything that's going to go into electric motors, the magnets that are needed, and, and all of that, uh, that type of new technology as we kind of shift from internal combustion engines and transmissions into new electric drives. Um, and uh, you see all the supply chain, which is enormous. Um, you know, we have a very good track record in Canada and the United States of co-investment in manufacturing. We've been a beneficiary of that, and so have all our competitors in the United States. And it's no accident that governments do it because it pays them back in taxes very quickly, frankly. It's one of the best investments you can have for economic development and growth. And then it begets an enormous supply chain that uh, mm. that flows from that in terms of, of products. We're just now going to need to to take advantage of a whole new supply chain that will not only go into the processing of, of goods that go into our cars, but uh, stretch back into our into our natural resources industries. And that's why you're seeing car companies like General Motors being much more vertically integrated now in terms of how they're thinking about the investments. And so it's not, uh, you know, we are investing in the processing of cathode active materials in Canada for our batteries. And, and uh, some car companies are even looking at investing in mines. Um, so, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's a, uh, a big, big ticket. Uh, we have to get it right. And uh, we worry uh, about making sure that we can do it fast enough because we have some deadlines. We need to get the entire car fleet over to electric by 2035. That is not easy. Right. Um, we also need to make sure that our consumers want to buy them and we can talk about that too because we could work together on that as well so so jeff and, and and susan are there any specific examples of of you know really direct policy alignment that moves us towards you know towards that future i'm thinking of um you know there's there might be tax credits for for certain investments or for mining just to get a sense of when you talked about the renewed roadmap and some of the i think agreements that Secretary of Energy Granholm and Minister Wilkinson had, um, you know, those are those are top level, but often 
there's things where you can drill down and say, hey, there's something very specific we're doing. And uh, just wondering if you have some examples you might wanna, wanna throw out. And I, ha I have one to offer too, if, 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 if you come up with a blank for a second. Um, thanks, uh, but I was gonna talk just a little bit, we, we talked a little bit around it, but the joint action plan, which I think really does outline this whole range of joint activities, research and development, supply chain modeling, increased support for industry. Uh, and so, you know, as we look to secure the supply of the critical minerals for these strategic industries and for defense, improving our information sharing on critical mineral resources, engaging with the private sector and working in the multilateral fora and with, you know, third countries. I think really from the U.S. perspective, and, and I, I see this in Canada too, it's, it is a whole of government priority. So, you know, what, where we're trying to get to, we're working across, you know, a broad range of activities and certainly given the close relationship that our two countries have, you know, we're only engaging in deepening these ties uh, between our countries. Uh, and certainly between, under the existing memorandum of understanding between our energy department and the Department of Natural Resources, you know, we are looking to enhance cooperation on sustainable and equity energy transitions, clean energy innovation, connectivity and low carbon transportation. And I think to some extent to, to David's point, you know, I think you know, innovation is a piece we haven't really talked a whole lot about, but you know, we've moved so quickly, it seems to me as a, again, sort of, you know, just a consumer of, into the electric vehicles, but or electric batteries, et cetera, but who knows what other innovation is out there. Uh, and then looking ahead to, you know, PDAC next week, you know, maybe we'll see other things coming down the pike too. Yeah, I, I want to build on that if I can, but, um, you, you know, Susan mentioned, you know, we are, I think all the notion of all hands on deck or a whole of government approach to this, I think is fairly inherent and, and it's easy to say, but when you put practical examples to it, so she spoke to the Department of Energy and the Nat Department of Natural Resources memorandum. So our clean energy research communities working with the DOE, the U.S. Department of Energy's clean energy research community. And some of that is on, you know, the approaches by which electric vehicles are charged, the, the, the approaches on which the technologies are being used as standards to kind of speed that process. And that all feeds the infrastructure that those cars are going to need. Um, it extends to, you know, uh, U.S. companies and U.S. Um, uh, interest investing in Canadian academic work. So some of the top battery research is going on in the University of Montreal, as well as Dalhousie University. And then, you know, it comes back the other way in which some of the minerals that are being produced in the U.S., both in, in uh, Minnesota and other places, are actually processed in Sudbury. So they're shipped from Minnesota to Sudbury. Um, they're refined in, in the facilities in Sudbury, which has a hub of nickel refining for Canada. And then they're kind of fed back into the, the, into the chain. And so um, that work that she mentioned for us to do what, we, what we've identified under the roadmap now as a priority for supply chain mapping is to, to try and actually break down the inputs in the chain and to recognize where the gaps are and where the good uh, collaboration is already happening and then try and incentivize as governments where we might be able to de-risk and move it along. And, you know, one of the points that David raised just from a General Motors point of view at 35 billion worth of retooling, you know, the two governments working together still could not spend enough and actually cover the cost of the transition. Really, it's about de-risking and incentivizing and, and sort of unleashing the private sector's capacity to retool and kind of invest heavily. And so part of this is about how does government help push? How does it solve problems? And how does it help de-risk? But the private sector has always built our economy and has always driven um, that process. And so to the extent to which we can kind of spark it, whether we can accelerate it, whether we can um, you know, contribute um, research at the front end that has more risky propositions. These are places where we see um, you know, tremendous opportunity to work. So that's why the joint R&D. So the other thing I'd, I'd wanna say is, and I think it builds on the comment that we started with, 
we already have a fairly integrated mineral economy. So Canada already and the United States share $120 billion a year worth of minerals that move across the border in both directions. That's not accounting for energy. That's just accounting for minerals alone. Um, some of which move from Canada to the United States. Others come from the US into Canada. Some of that processing happens in either country. And then the other side of this, that's really, really, I think gonna be part of the solution is, this, is the recycling and circular part. So we know that as vehicles are being produced and the life of the vehicle comes to its conclusion, there's value in all of the battery material, there's value in the metal and all of the components that we'll be able to both as a country, as one country and as two countries working together, recycle. And that will provide us a source of input material, but there's real important work to harmonize on regulatory space. So how do we make sure that there aren't barriers that are well intended perhaps for specific reasons, but actually limit and, and sort of constrain the movement of some of the materials as we think about them back and forth across um, the border and how that trade kind of builds around it. Because there's a whole new part of this in terms of recycling and circular that will also emerge as an important supply and source of supply for the, for the EV battery community. Absolutely, very you know, excellent points, insightful in fact. We are seeing some conversation in Europe about a, a, a battery passport uh, to demonstrate, I guess, that uh, the battery that's going to go into a car has been sourced ethically, is not from a conflict zone, is is not, you know, leading to displacement of of, of peoples and 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 fauna. So there's there's some really interesting connectivity there about. Uh, what people haven't thought a lot about yet, which is the yeah the circular economy part of this, how we make sure that we're going to be hitting on, on all cylinders, so to speak, when we when we get there. Um, something which I'd like to maybe pose to, to Susan, and it has to do with with some of the U.S. approach to securing a, a critical mineral supply chain, and that's the use of the Defense Production Act. Um, can you speak a little bit to that, Susan? What what that means? Uh, why that's a, a particularly uh, why that tool was chosen? Sure, I can uh, address that a bit. So uh, President Biden uh, took action to support the clean energy transition and enhance our energy security um, by uh, through this directive, which strengthens domestic production of critical minerals used for large capacity batteries and hopefully reduces US dependence on unreliable foreign sources. So he invoked the part of the Defense Production Act which will incentivize production through purchases, purchase commitments, and other means. Uh, from, the, from the US and Canada, we will continue, we do continue our work together on critical minerals cooperation uh, underlying, under the roadmap that we talked about and the joint action for critical minerals. And then how the president then, I guess, directed the use of the defense uh, tools to secure domestic production capabilities of strategic and critical minerals to help bolster our clean energy economy and reduce reliance on unreliable foreign sources. At this point, the Department of Defense is the implementing authority for the directive. And as far as we know, has not yet announced specifics as to which companies will be eligible. But we understand that you know, they are working on that and we should have something, you know, I don't wanna say in the near future, but in the future. Great, great, thanks. Um, Jeff, I'd like to maybe pose a question to you. Most of Canada's critical minerals endowment is on territory that's either uh, that's subject to, to Indigenous title or asserted title. And just wondering, what are the implications for a reconciliation process of expanded exploration and activity on, on Indigenous lands? Well, listen, I, I, I really appreciate that question because I, I at the outset, you know, underlined um, that factor, which is that, you know, many of Canada's resources are in Indigenous territories or on asserted to territories or traditional territories that are used for traditional purposes. So at, at, the, at the heart of it, um, the transition to the clean energy future offers a tremendous opportunity for economic reconciliation. It, it's just by the very nature of the minerals that we need, the possibilities for developing those in a, in a sustainable and appropriate way. And with Indigenous peoples as partners from the beginning. And so the first part of that is, um, you know, Canada uh, at this point is, is developing a critical mineral strategy for the country, um, PDAC's next week. So perhaps there'll be more about that at PDAC. 
And an important part of, of what we've recognized is that indigenous uh, communities and the opportunities are real. And what we need to be doing and need to be thinking through is how that engagement with indigenous communities starts at the beginning and that it is part of that process. And although we're talking about speed here today and about the need to move quickly, um, it's also equally important that we move in the right way. And in the right way, um, we move in a fashion that provides durability and certainty, both for the investors in those uh, particular areas, but also for the communities that are going to be impacted, whether it's positive impacts through employment and business opportunities, or whether it's impacts with the disruptions that come from development or loss of a particular use of a land site for a period of time. So, you know, the federal budget that just happened here in uh, up, up in Ottawa, for those who are um, from the United States that are watching, had about $100 million worth of funding for economic reconciliation with Indigenous peoples for NRCAN to work on early engagement and to start the groundwork and to work more closely with Indigenous communities at the beginning of the process to sort of help develop um, stronger ties and, and to identify those opportunities. At the same time, the government's commitment to implement United Nations Declaration and of Rights of Indigenous Peoples and an act that in Parliament that's been put forward that has us implementing uh, UNDRIP, as it's called, in a way that makes sure that uh, we are fulfilling what UNDRIP lays out for Indigenous communities in the context of our reconciliation with Indigenous peoples. So it is at the core of what critical minerals are and the strategy that we're developing and will be part and parcel of how we move forward. Thank you, Jeff. Yeah, I'm going to be absolutely critical, uh, essential. Um, Rahul, we'll change gears just for a sec. I'll pose a question to you. And um, about 45% of the world's public mining companies are, are listed on the TSX, the Toronto Stock Exchange. Um, and raising global capital for, for critical minerals is now really subject to these ESG issues. We've, we've talked a little bit about environment, social and governance disclosure becoming a prominent consideration. So how does Mon Ontario's mining and, and maybe critical mineral sector measure up using ESG metrics? Sure, well, as you mentioned in your question, and I think as Jeff touched on earlier on in our conversation, we've definitely seen ESG related factors emerge as a key metric uh, for investors and, and within the capital markets. Domestically, I think that trend is definitely taking hold here through the regulatory function, uh, as we've seen the Ontario Securities Commission uh, and the broader group of Canadian security <coughs> administrators across the country adopt much more aggressive climate-related financial disclosure requirements, which is a, a core component of ESG, uh, and that will have implica implications across the capital markets, including uh, the TSX and the venture exchanges. You know, overall, I think Ontario's sector measures up very well compared to global compar uh, comparators uh, on these metrics and serves, uh, you know, really as a compare uh, as a competitive advantage. Uh, but and with a caveat, really, if if the rest of the world holds itself to these same standards and metrics as well, which I which I think is still a, a bit of a TBD, um, with the ongoing supply chain uh, shocks, you know, I've often heard that the S and ESG could also now be for security, as in security of supply. Uh, and I think with the ongoing focus on resiliency, uh, vertical integration, insourcing, et cetera, you know, I think that also offers another great competitive advantage for, for Ontario sector and the Canadian sector and North American sectors overall. Um, the Ontario Mining Association has done a lot of good work on this uh, and their recent state of the mining sector report, you know, outlines some of the success in this regard. So a couple of things they've, they've kind of noted. Um, you know, for example, that the mining sector here adopts advanced clean technologies at a rate of 14% uh, above the Ontario industry average. Uh, more than three quarters of Ontario's mining companies are actively engaged uh, in formal programs that are focused on lowering GHG emissions and spurring innovation. And we see a lot of, a lot of uh, innovations on the horizon around things like small modular reactors uh, and, and other sorts of innovations that... Uh, you know, really could put the mining sector at the forefront of, uh, of these efforts. Bud, you're on mute. Thank you. I knew that would happen. Um, Rahul, uh, we actually have a question from a, from a viewer that I think plugs very well into what you just responded to, but maybe you can expand on. So here's the question. Recently, Windsor lost a major potential EV value chain investment due to limited availability of clean power. 
Could you speak to how Ontario is working to position itself as an attractive investment destination to meet the clean power needs of these investors and domestic companies wanting to scale up? I think you addressed some of that, but please. Sure, no, it's, it's a good question. I think obviously, um, you know, ending on June 2nd and for those 28 days preceding that, we were in, in the middle of a provincial election. Uh, and this, this issue did come up uh, during the election, uh, particularly in the Windsor region and its importance. From my understanding, um, and you know, I think has now been echoed by Mayor Drew Dilkins of Windsor uh, and Windsor Economic Development and the company in question, uh, LG Chem as well. I, you know, I think they've clarified that the LG Chem facility, which really is a, a follow-on investment to a $5 billion new battery manufacturing development in the, in the Windsor region, um, you know, is still very much in play. Um, and so the notion that it's been lost out, I, I think is, uh, has been corrected. So I just wanted to you know, state that. I think that's good news that uh, the region and the province and, you know, ultimately the country is still in, in the running for a very important investment. Um, you know, some of the efforts that are being taken and, and I think speak to uh, this in particular and then more broadly, uh, the, you know, uh, I, the IESO here in Ontario and the Ontario government, you know, have announced a billion dollars uh, for five new transmission lines uh, to and through southwestern Ontario to address these these exact specific concerns. So that's underway and and is is you know viewed as a very important fix. You know, the other sort of elements that are often cited are the fact that ninety five percent of the electricity that's generated here in Ontario is uh, net zero and emissions free. Uh, that uh, is an important factor, and what, what I understand is increasingly a key component of uh, the investment attraction pitch uh, that the province uh, is making to companies and, and those that are particularly um, involved in investments in the critical minerals and battery and uh, supply chains. That's a key factor. Um, so I think you'll see increasing investments being made with that regard and, in, and an increasing emphasis being placed uh, on uh, the competitive advantages like the 95% metric uh, that, uh, that we already have at our disposal. Thanks, Rahul, that's, that's great. Um, you know, we've talked a little bit here about the, um, the beginning, uh, the middle and the end of the, the sort of EV battery value chain and that, that midstream where you're producing cathode active materials and anode active materials is, uh, I understand represents about 40% of the value of a battery. And that itself, the battery represents, you know, maybe a third, maybe perhaps more uh, of the value of the EV itself. And, and most of that activity, the midstream happens in China. We've all acknowledged that and mentioned it. Um, but it seems that that's a, that's a very different space from then supporting mining to supporting, you know, vehicle assembly. This is something that the midstream of processing hasn't really been happening in North America for 30-ish years. Um, wh what are Canada and the U.S.? doing specifically to repatriate that midstream portion of the critical minerals value chain. And I'm happy to hear from, from, uh, from any of you on the panel, your perspectives or thoughts. Well, I, I can jump in and start off. What we're doing is, is investing here. Um, and uh, we've started that off um, in Baconcourt, Quebec with a plan to have cathode active material production up there uh, by the start of 2025. Uh, but we're not the only one there. There's a there's a vibrant uh, bunch of other groups, some which are sort of build it and they will come uh, types that are looking for customers. We're more integrated in, in terms of being the customer for the battery and then ultimately through to our dealers and our customers. Um, others will make a play as the traditional auto supply chain um, to to be in part of that, and then certainly the the critical minerals production itself will base itself off of the traditional mining industry, but they have processing challenges that are new as well. So take nickel, which is um, you know one of the the you know you mentioned cathode active materials that alone is the forty percent of what goes into one of our into one of our batteries that leaves aside the anode stuff, which is graphite and other types of things. So. Uh, cathode active is the positive end of the battery, if you will, um, and it's made up of um, usually primarily nickel, but also manganese, cobalt, and um, and then lithium. 
and uh, so those are all processed together and there's more there's processing at all stages of the of that so just the nickel stream needs to move from nickel into nickel sulfate and then nickel sulfate gets turned into what's called precam which is like a, a crystalline material and then that gets turned into cathode active material so there's a very significant stages um, this can be done in a very environmentally beneficial way uh, as Rule said, you know, it can be done with power sources that are net zero, um, which is great. Um, and Canada has some 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 positives there. We have, uh, for instance, in General Motors in the United States, in the the in California, uh, with um, some lithium production with amazing sources of um, geothermal power that is net zero as well, and will produce our our lithium streams. Um, so there there is a whole emerging um, chemistry um, and as we mentioned before this is early stages I mean R&D is going to be critical here to be able to do the magical thing that we need to do with our batteries which is sort of two engineering challenges one we need the battery to go farther so we'd like them to all be able to go a thousand kilometers and we'd like to have them be cheaper um, and these things kind of counterpoint to each other. And so that's what R&D is, is really looking at. And if we can bring the cost of our batteries down, then the, uh, you know, the value proposition of selling them for our customers all starts to work as well. Um, so, you know, customer doesn't want to sacrifice anything in terms of how far they can drive. They want to know that charging is not going to be a pain and, uh, and they want to understand how that's going to work. So we have a lot of work to do on charging infrastructure. And Jeff mentioned this earlier, um, you know, we're investing um, in 40,000 chargers across the United States, 4,000 across Canada with our dealers as sort of a kickstart to put chargers in our local communities so our customers will know if they're in a condo or if they're in an apartment and they don't have a place to charge where they can go to charge up their vehicle. But in Canada alone, you know, you know, we've got a target, I think, of 50,000 out of the government. We need 4 million to be able to support the, uh, the, the Canadian auto sector at full tilt in 2035. So we're going to have to do this together. And the private sector is going to have to be part of it. The government's going to have to be part of it. We're not asking the government to install the entire, entire charging uh, thing. But we're going to have to work together because we're going to change the battery chemistry and the fast charging capabilities. We're inventing the stuff. And so we need to be there and at the table to help people understand, you know, where to make the proper investments on the highways, in the condos, you know, what is the, the technology that is going to help people to uh, have a seamless transportation solution that's better for the environment? Thank you. Um, I, I, I don't know if anyone else in the panel wants to, to, to build on that, um, but, but if not, maybe, oh, go ahead, Jeff, please. Yeah, I, I, look, I think David's really laid it out nicely, but I, I, I think what, what he's also said is the scale of the change that's happening. Um, you know, our minds today produce products that are shipped around the world and continue to do that. And what we're looking at is sort of some of that and big chunks of that production to shift to producing new goods. So processed goods that then feed into new business lines, producing cathode and anode material that then leads to batteries is a whole new business opportunity. And so the way that the private sector is moving, both being vertically integrated in some instances or creating strong partnerships and joint ventures along the chain, all of that's happening before our eyes and it's happening quickly. And the time it's going to take for some of those things to kind of come to ground in terms of what's the right model and what works for different companies is going to happen over the next decade as they're rapidly moving to produce the vehicles. And so as governments, we're, we're investing in the research side to make sure that, that the new battery chemistries, the new more efficient ways of producing with less greenhouse gas emissions, less waste can help move that yard, the, the dial so that less you know, input material is needed, but saying less is needed is saying instead of needing 190,000 new tons, we're going to need 150,000 new tons, but we still need 150,000 new tons, which is an incredible amount of, of, of output. Um, the other place to, I think is, is to think through is using the tools we have. So Susan could probably speak to some, but in Canada, we're using the Strategic Innovation Fund uh, to bring some of these pieces together. And we're strategically looking at the whole chain 
And so, you know, from General Motors as one part of the chain that's also investing in further uh, up the chain to other companies who are coming in at specific stages in the chain and wanting to, to, to put their, uh, you know, to put their plant in North America or in Canada and then want to kind of know that around them there's an ecosystem of either inputs or customers for their product. And what we're noticing as well is that, you know, um, for each new project that gets announced, there's usually a satellite of projects around it um, because the customers are coming and the relationships already exist between trusted businesses. And so they're bringing their, their partners with them. And so there's a lot of interesting dynamic happening on both sides of the border. And some of those relationships cross the border and some of them happen even across here to Europe. So it's just the scale is so enormous. And so the, the more we do this together and the stronger we think about how it happens, the better the outcome will be. And if I can build on one thing Jeff's saying too, that that also extends to probably one of the larger worries in the industry is the alignment of the regulatory environment. We, we can deal with almost any regulatory environment. What we can't deal with is a, is a patchwork of different regulatory environments. And this is always a challenge for governments, you know, especially when you're dealing at state and provincial and federal levels, et cetera. But, uh, you know, we've had an integrated auto sector across North America where our main regulations have been harmonized between Canada and the United States for decades. And uh, we need to keep that um, in place because the one thing that scares away investment is to have to do it again differently. And, uh, and so the more that we can operate from uh, mines to mobility in one set of integrated regulations, the more successful we'll be. And that's in the hands of Jeff and Susan to fix all that. <laughs> I'll, just, I'll just add very briefly i know we're close to time you know certainly from our perspective as we are talking about whole of government um in terms of you know interagency cooperation and how so let's say our department of commerce is focused on reducing the critical mineral supply chain risk for u.s companies but both looking for export and inward investment opportunities as well as enhancing international trade and cooperation and certainly from u.s companies perspective the fact that you know Canada has such a predictable investment climate, but also through its commitments to clean energy, as uh, Paul mentioned, you know, working with the indigenous communities. I mean, th these are there's some really great opportunities. So it's up to the, the governments, and then you know, focusing and helping support the private sector in making these things happen. We have a couple of questions from uh, from our viewers, and they're actually. Uh, sort of a similar question and one wanted it posed to David and one wanted it posed to Jeff. So I'm gonna throw this out for Jeff and David to, to play with a bit. Um, so lithium iron batteries is increasingly the, the, the chemistry of choice for low cost EV models. Um, and, but there seems to be according to another questioner um, that there's still a, a focus on, on the, the nickel um, cobalt batteries, I suppose, the, the, the typical lithium ion type of concoction that we see now. Can both of you speak to where the lithium ion battery uh, trend is in, in the private sector and in Canada? Well, very quickly, I just I, speaking from from our perspective, um, you know, it goes back to that challenge of R&D to help give you more range and, and less cost. And so one of the most costly aspects in the current lithium ion battery setup for electric vehicles is cobalt. And so we've actually reduced our, our input of cobalt from our initial Bolt EV uh, vehicle batteries that came on the market five years ago to today by about 40 or 50 percent. Uh, and we'll continue to do that and uh, we can find substitutes in the chemistry. So batteries are about chemistry and um, and the and there are new solid state uh, things. We have major investments in that. Um, so it's going to continue. Um, and this is the challenge. You know, we're at early state. We're, you know, in, in the internal combustion world, we're, I don't know, about 19, 19, 1920. I mean, think of how many improvements were made to the internal combustion engine by 2020. Um, so there's going to be massive improvements. And that's critical for us to profitably uh, make this transition, uh, bring down the cost for us and for our consumers. And uh, at the end of the day, we believe in it strongly. We're all in because we think we can make more money at the end of the day by, um, you know, in, through innovation. Uh, 
And that's why we have over a thousand people doing R and D in, in Canada right now. It's the mm-hmm. second largest R and D section for GN in the world outside of the United States. Thanks. Uh, Jeff, maybe you've got about 30 seconds probably. Yeah. So quickly, I mean, governments are not likely to pick winners and losers in terms of what private sector is going to choose in terms of battery chemistry. But I mean, the, the overall trend, when you look at the forecast is all of the inputs for all of the particular battery types need to skyrocket in terms of production and the recycling component will need to recycle all of it. So whether it's lithium ion or whether it's lithium phosphate, um, it, it, there are a number of different and innovation is driving better performance and better efficiencies at producing and it will only continue in that fashion so um, from our perspective we're kind of investing in all of those choices um, recognizing the private sector will make the ultimate choice as to how they tool their factories fantastic we've come pretty much to the end but if anyone wants to give a 10 second you know word uh, on, on what ha- needs to happen next for this all to happen. Uh, love to hear it. So I'll give a point around if anyone wants to raise their hand for one last one last hurrah. We have 10 seconds or so. I'll I just say I, I, I couldn't have a more exciting time to be in the industry right now. This is like going back to the inception and reinventing the whole thing. And it's not just batteries. It's the entire technological connectivity of the car and, and the like. And, you know, the opportunities for our countries in the United States and Canada together in technology uh, across the board is unsurpassed. And so we've got to do this together. Jeff, Susan. I think we're... I'll say, you know, addressing climate change is of paramount importance for our countries and really looking as we work together in this incredibly de- decisive decade as we, you know, spur innovative solution solutions and ensure an equitable transition to a clean energy future. I think it is an exciting time and lots of interesting things happening. Great. Well, thank you, Jeff, Rahul, if you have anything to add. You can say it now, but um, I think I think we've covered it almost all. Thank you so much, all of you. We've run a little bit over time, but it was well worth it. Hope to have this conversation continue if we see you, some of you in Toronto at PDAC. Thanks everyone for watching.